next witness. Call Torpedo Man, please. Tell the court what happened, in your own words, please. Well, sirs, it was like this. We was on this trial cruise and was running at about 10 fathoms of Stein's Point when the mine got us. Lieutenant Paul had told that story first, then Engineer Norton had given his version. Spear had told the story next, followed by Genvy. Now Priest was repeating it. Each story was the same yet a little different and each sentence struck the lieutenant like the lash of a whip. They had been running at 10 fathoms at half speed when the explosion came. Probably it had been a drifted acoustic or magnetic mine, which should have rusted long before, for a contact one would have finished everything and everyone at once. It had just been 1,430 hours when the submarine shattered to a blow that felt like the impact of Thor's hammer. Her tail rose, she rolled half over and started down in a steep, swift dive. Men fell or were flung in scrambling heaps. Lieutenant Paul, half stunned, found himself under four heavy men. Almost instantly, it seemed Lieutenant Commander Orm's voice rang over the uproar. Stop engines! Blow one and two! Blow four and six. The engines had been racing above top speed, and every man knew the reason. The blast had blown the propellers off. Now it was impossible to reverse, and unless she were checked soon, the submarine's steel bow would crumple like tin as she ran the bottom of the sea. The engines died, and the bow began to rise as she rolled back to a level keel. But she still slid forward, deeper and deeper, from the initial impetus of the dive. Blow seven and eight. Hard arise with the boat planes. Hard aport. Steering gears jammed, sir. At that moment, the submarine struck. But the speed of her downward rush had been checked. She was almost on an even keel, and the bottom was the tip of the sandbank that extended from Stein's Point, not the rocky ocean floor. And he orders, report your instruments. They had reported. Bow planes immovable, apparently buried in sand. The radio was still usable, though damaged. The boat tanks could be neither blown nor flooded, their veins dogged with sand. At the stern, the propellers were gone, the steering gear wrecked, and the stern tanks flooded. All the hatches were hopelessly jammed. But by some miracle, there was no leak in the ship itself. The crew had come through fairly well. One man, though stunned, was found to be dead, and two men had broken ribs. All had bruises and scrapes. Call the shore station, and let me know as soon as you have them, please. Shore station's calling us, sir. Our tender got some of the blast and reported we were probably hit. Right, I'll talk to them. Yes, sir, must have been a mine. Our steering gear is wrecked, propellers have gone, and she dived into the sands off Stein's Point. The stern tanks are flooded, and she won't move her at all. None of her hatches, even the escape ones, can be opened. Torpedo Man Kimmel is dead. The rest are all right. We're about 30 fathoms down. We can be reached fairly easily and we've enough air for almost two days. How soon can our second one be ready, sir? How about planes then, sir? I see, sir.
What's wrong, sir? As you heard, our tender got some of the blast. It jammed her steering gear for a minute. The strip was to test the new stabilizers in a storm, like the one topside. The storm just drifted our tender onto those rocks. Remember them? And she is burning like a torch. The next nearest one is in dry dock, 400 miles away, with half her plates off. She can't possibly get here for a week. Planes are grounded until the storm ends, and they can't bring all the equipment they'll need to get us out. The shore station is doing all it can to find another ship. Lieutenant Paul recalled his feelings. Their own tender wrecked and no other ship near meant rescue was impossible for five days, more like a week, and they had air for less than two days. Have a drink served all round, please, Mr. Paul, and send four bottles forward to me. When they have had the drink, send the five married men to me. We was glad to get that drink, sirs, and when we down it, we five reported to the old man. Beg pardon, sirs, Captain Norm. He told us he had special duty for four of us, what could only be done by married men with families, and as far as he knew, there was not nothing to choose between us. Would we draw lots? We did, and Norden, Spear, Janby, and me got the marked one. Any luck with the ship, sir? That's absolutely certain, then, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll call again. Assemble the men, please, Mr. Paul. I wish to say a few words to them. Men, <clears throat> men, I have a few things to say, and they're not all pleasant, nor easy. First, I'd like to say that I think you're the finest crew I've ever seen, let alone commanded. I know that you will take this news like men. You know what's happened. Well, we're stuck. And we're stuck until someone on top pulls the sub up, for all our hatches are stuck too. Now, there is one very hard job to be done, but it's one that can be done only by men with families. You know them. They do lots for the job just now, and Priest, Norton, Spear, and Janvi got it. I'll tell them what it is in a few minutes. I thank you for the quick, cheerful way you have carried out orders. That's all. Now all pass here with your mugs. Married men lost and we'll drink a toast. No early sipping and no heel taps and then we'll get on with our next job. God save our country and king! Men. The shore station reports her tender is wrecked and on fire. The other one is in dry dock, as you know, and can't get here for a week. They have contacted all the planes they can, and the earliest any help can arrive is between six and seven days. We had air for less than two days for all of us. Now there will be air for all five of you for seven days. Obey my last orders. Mr. Paul, you will take command. Men, remain alive and take your orders from Mr. Paul. You can still serve your country. Your job is to wait. And, and why not you, sir? I am going to join my crew as soon as I, I have made my report. Captain Oram wrote out the report, then signed it. 
He then had the bodies placed in an end compartment. I have arranged that Lieutenant Paul, engineers Norden and Genby, Torpedo Man Priest and Coxswain Spear will survive by arranging the death of the fifteen others. None of the others had the least idea of what I intended doing. I arranged the men with family should survive. The entire responsibility is mine. No, sir, you won't be able to court-martial me. I could condemn my whole crew to death or sacrifice fifteen and save five. And I'm going to join the others. Goodbye, sir. Then six days later they reached us, sirs. God, we was glad. That is all. Gentlemen, it is for you to decide, guilty or not guilty. Guilty or not guilty.